let's improve our world by adding guns. The first step is to select an image for our gun. This is easy to overlook, but it does matter. For our tutorial, I chose to use Alice Toys of Madness for reasons, but anything should be fine. Okay, once we've selected an image, we'll need to define the file names. With textures, I converted to an array because I wanted to draw them to the color buffer directly. However, our gun will not appear in the 3D world, but rather it'll be an overlay. So let's go ahead and make a new function to load an image. So here, rather than convert, which will convert the surface to the Windows native surface format, I'm going to use convert alpha, and that will also take in alpha transparency. So let's go ahead and load the gun frames. It's time to revisit the way all of this is working. Currently, the renderer system holds the screen surface and it gives a NumPy array to each of its states in order to render. But it would be nice to just do regular Pi game surface splitting. So let's refactor this so that the states now take in the surface and handle color buffer splitting. And we're now ready to draw a gun. So I'll do this in a separate function because I'm going to be adding some modifications to it. But yeah, let's draw a gun. Okay, so yeah, as you can see, we're picking the first image here, which by the way, the way these images work is the first frame is just the gun and then subsequent frames are the animations of shooting and reloading so big reveal <laughs> right that's fine i mean it should just be screen number one rule copy paste is bad and there we have it we can pack up and go home right we're done Okay, so I'd like to have the gun sway side to side as we walk. And this can sort of be hacked together with a few if statements in our renderer, where the renderer directly checks like which keys are currently pressed to see whether we should be walking right now. But there's a problem with this. And the problem is that I want to segregate the controller logic away from the renderer a little somewhat. How can we do this? In a word, observers. Okay, so imagine that we have a data structure representing a message. Right now we'll keep it really simple and just have an integer which describes what event has happened. Then a system can observe messages by tracking them with an event queue, which can just be a simple list. So let's say we're looking at our renderer our renderer will have some sort of event queue. Just a list of integers where those integer codes are describing a number of events. And what we can do is in the update, we can look through and act. And then at the end of every update, 
we will clear out the event queue so that it doesn't get overloaded. So this is the basic idea. Systems can act as observers, but how do we feed them messages? Well, it's simple. A system can be observed by tracking a list of all the event queues it will publish to. Maybe it doesn't sound so simple. Here's the basic idea. Um, let's say I go to my game and I say right up the top in the initialization, maybe before we do the system stuff, I'll have a list of observers and that will be a list of event queues. So a list of lists of integers. And we've got our renderer that we've just made. So we will append the renderer's event queue to our set. And I'll make a function to publish an event. If this game had a number of different systems that were observing its messages, it would be appending that message code to the event queues for all systems observing it. Um, so of course, things get a little trickier with our renderer being a state machine, but not that much trickier. So we can assume that the states are gonna handle the events just fine. And then we can take in a reference to the renderer's event queue and deal with it. Okay, so of course, when we make each of these states, we pass in our event queue. And then the job of handling the events will be offloaded to the states. But this is super important. The clearing of the event queue is going to be done still in the main renderer. And the benefit of this, I'll just go ahead and put this in. The benefit of this is that only the game renderer needs to worry about messages right now. The map renderer takes in the event queue, but is free to completely ignore it. The map renderer does not have a responsibility to clear the event queue. That is always done in one spot by the renderer. So the philosophy here is that we're building an architecture of belts rather than rods, if you want to think about mechanical components. When you've got two mechanical components in motion, if there's a rigid rod connecting them, then they're really linked together. If one fails, then the other fails. But with belts, they affect each other, they talk to each other, but they're somewhat independent. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So uh, let's push on with it. We'll go ahead and publish some walk stop events. So we'll go to the game and then down in handle keys, we've got a few cases. In the case where no movement is happening, we can publish the stop event. And in the case where movement is happening, we can publish that we're walking. Okay. On the other side, we can handle those events. So I'll go to the game renderer and I'll make a bit of state. And now this stuff is time-based. So what I'm gonna do is top down. So I'll go to my game and I'll go to the main loop. And then here where I update the renderer, I'm also going to pass in the amount of time which has occurred since the last update and it'll just flow through. So I'll go in here and in my update function, I'll also take in the frame time and I'll pass that along to the state. And then likewise, the map renderer, it does need to be in there, but we can completely ignore it. But for the game renderer, this is important. Okay, so as for handling these events, um, I can just set a variable here. Okay, and then in the draw gun function, 
I'm going to have a bit of conditional logic depending on whether the player is walking at the moment. Okay, so in the case that we are walking, this should more or less make sense. You know, the walk time goes up, and then the horizontal offset of the gun is just the sine function, so it should be bobbing, you know, back and forth. This is a little bit funky here in the else case. In the else case, what I want to do is linearly revert to the center from whichever direction I'm off by. So you know, if we are to the right, then this sign will be positive and our offset will be, whoops, will be decreasing. If we're to the left, then the sign of that will be negative and our offset will be increasing. So we'll be coming back to the center. And then this check here is to check whether we've crossed over the middle point because we could be going from a positive offset to a negative offset or negative to positive. In both those cases, the product will be negative and then we just reset the offset to zero. So what I'm getting at is we can go ahead and add the offset here and that will give us horizontal motion. So moment of truth, let's see how it looks. Okay, so here we are going back and forth and we sort of always revert to the center. Okay, so we can walk around, now let's shoot. So luckily the framework we built for walking also lets us handle shooting events. We'll go ahead and define a shooting code. And then we'll publish it from the game controller. So we'll go in and in this event loop, we can check and say if our event type is basically a left click. So that's pi game mouse button down. Then we'll go ahead and publish a shoot event. Okay, now we'll go ahead and we'll handle that in the game renderer. So we'll go back to our game renderer and just here I'll add some more state Okay, so we'll track whether we're shooting. We'll track the frame index that we're on. Remember, we have that animation, so these are all different frames. And um, we also, I'm also going to track how many milliseconds we've been on that current frame to control the animation speed. Okay, so let's go in here and say, well, if we got a shoot event, then we'll say, yep, yeah, we're shooting. And let's reset our frame index. It's going to go immediately to frame one. That's when the shot occurs. Okay, so draw a gun. So I'll pop in here just under the walking logic. And I'm going to define how long to spend on each animation frame. And then we'll do our shooting logic. Okay, so what we do is we increment the frame counter and then if enough time has occurred, we tick over to the next frame and decrement, you know, reset the counter. And then also if we've wrapped over the animation, then we just go back to the beginning, we lock things off and say, okay, we're done shooting. Now, all we need to do is use our gun frame index to select the appropriate image from that animation. Let's give it a go. There we have it. A little snappy, I don't know, what do you think? But uh, there's a problem with this, and the problem is we can just keep shooting. This is a machine gun, and the reload is basically meaningless. So, 
how can we get this working? Mm, let's be tricky about it. Let's make the renderer publish back to the game when the animation is done. Because, as we saw, the renderer can correctly identify when that animation is ended. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this publish function and I'm going to make it a public helper. So I'll grab it here, it's gone, and I'll just go to config and define it there. Okay, simple enough. Of course, we'll have to go back through the game and anywhere we published, we'll use that um, helper function. Okay, so now I'm going to give the game an event queue. And I'm also going to give the game some state. So I'm going to say, uh, can shoot. That starts off as true. Now, when we shoot down here, I want to also set the, the status to false. And I'm also going to take that in to account when I try to shoot in the first place. Okay, great. So now I'm going to look through my event queue and I'll say, okay, if we've got, oh, I'll need to define this, a reload event. So I'll go message type, reload. And then I'll say, okay, if I get that reload message, then I'll reset so that I can shoot. And of course, I'll always clear out my event queue. Okay, so now we can hook everything up. So that's all fine on the game end, but the renderer end is now gonna be observed. So I'm just going to, oh, this is a little messy. I'll just go here and have some observers. And I'll pass that over to each of the states, should they ever want to publish messages. Okay, so then down in the states, I'll do the map renderer first. But it'll be the same thing for the game renderer. Okay, great. So now any of my states can publish messages at any point. And in particular, if we identify that we've got an animation end, then we can go ahead and publish the reload message. Okay, cool. And then we'll go to the game. And after the game has set everything up, it has created the renderer. We'll say, okay, get the observers of the renderer and append our event queue. Cool, okay, so again, the game is publishing like walking and shooting messages to the renderer, and the renderer is publishing reload messages back to the game. Let's go ahead and test this out. Okay, so something's gone a little off. I can shoot once, let me try that again. Ah, whoops, I put this in the wrong spot. So that was going to just reload any time I stopped walking. Okay, let's go ahead and do it at the proper place. Okay, so I can shoot and I can shoot continually, but what I can't do is machine gun it. I have to wait for the reload to occur. So there we have it. So look, it's very difficult to understate the power of this technique. The dream in game development is for any system to message any other part of the system, but doing this in a performant and sane way without circular imports is tricky, but now it's possible. So that'll be it for now. I'll see you again in 10 years when I make the next video in this series. Um, but yeah, all the best. Have a good one. Bye.